Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Georgetown Law Federal Society's event, The State of Healthcare Policy from COVID-19 to Medicare for All. My name is Patrick Lyons, and I am co-president of our FedSoc chapter here at Georgetown. The Federal Society is a group of conservatives and libertarians interested in the current state of the legal order, it is founded on the principles that the state exists to preserve freedom, that the separation of governmental powers is central to our constitution, and that it is emphatically the province and duty of the judiciary to say what the law is, not what it should be. The society seeks both to promote an awareness of these principles and to further their application through its activities. As always, please note that all expressions of opinion in this afternoon's event are those of the speakers. We are joined today by our distinguished speakers, Professor Larry Gostin, Professor David Hyman, Professor Greg Block, and Professor Timothy Westmoreland. Professor Gostin is the university professor, Georgetown's uh, highest academic rank conferred by the university president. Professor Gostin directs the O'Neill Institute for National and Global Health and is the founding O'Neill Chair in Global Health Law. He served as Associate Dean for Research at Georgetown Law from 2004 to 2008. He is Professor of Medicine at Georgetown University and Professor of Public Health at the John Hopkins University. Professor Gostin is the Director of WHO Collaborating Center on National- You actually don't need to go through it all. I think that's okay. <laughs> more than enough. Okay, um, all right. I'm thoroughly embarrassed already, so just- Let's do two sentences for on. each of us, Patrick. Sure, sure, <laughs> sure. Um, professor Hyman is the Scott K. Ginsburg Professor of Health Law and Policy at Georgetown Law. Um, he focuses his research and writings on the regulation and financing of healthcare law and he uh, teaches in the areas of regulation, civil procedure, insurance, medical malpractice, law and economics, professional responsibility, and tax policy. And uh, professor, okay. <laughs> professor Block is the Carmack Waterhouse Professor of Health Law, Policy, and Ethics at Georgetown Law. Uh, he is notably the author of Hippocratic Myth, Why Doctors Are Under Pressure to Ration Care, Practice Politics, and Compromise Their Promise to Heal. And he's a nationally and re internationally recognized expert on health law, and policy. And finally, we have uh, Pro Professor Westmoreland, who has taught at Georgetown University about health law, federal budgets, and legislation since 2001. Uh, prior to that, he was the senior policy fellow at the Federal Legislation Clinic, and he's worked extensively on public health and health finance policy. Um, thank you to all of you for joining us this afternoon. Uh, we will start by discussing the policies surrounding the COVID-19 pandemic, and then shift gears to talk about the current state of the US healthcare system. Uh, we'll then open the floor up for Q&A from our attendees. Um, if anyone has questions for our speakers, uh, please submit them via the Q&A feature. So to start, I'd like to hear from each of you about, um, you know, how the U.S. has responded to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, specifically, what are, you know, some areas where we've performed well in addressing the pandemic? What are some areas where we did not? And finally, what are, you know, some takeaway lessons that we have learned uh, from dealing with this crisis. Um, we will start, uh, if uh, Professor Gaston, if you'd like to start us off. Okay, it's, I mean, it's always it's virtually, well, it's not virtually impossible. It is impossible to answer that question in, um, uh, you know, in five minutes. And we've had a, you know, the most catastrophic um, event of any of our lifetimes. Um, so, you know, st starting, you know, back um, in January of 2020, um, you know, we, you know, saw, you know, the city the size of Wuhan um, locked down 11 million people and then 20 million in the Water Hubei province um, in, uh, uh, in uh, uh, China. The, you know, at the time, um, the world had never seen such a complete shutdown, at least not since perhaps the 1918 influenza pandemic. And even then the records are not clear on this. Certainly when I, when I helped uh, the CDC draft the Model Emergency Health Powers Act after 9-11 and the anthrax attacks, I envisaged most of the um, powers that would be used uh, uh, during this pandemic, but I don't think I could have imagined that uh, a city the size of Wuhan would be locked down. Um, 
you know, Wuhan was locked down with very intrusive surveillance and punishment. Um, and I remember at the time I was saying publicly, you know, this could never happen in a Western democracy. But of course, that's exactly what happened. Um, it, you know, Paris, Milan, London, um, New York, uh, San Francisco, um, and even Delhi, um, uh, even India, the entire country, um, a lockdown in, in the most um, dramatic, um, you know, deprivation of freedom that we could, could which we couldn't have even imagined. Um, you know, and so in the United States, I don't think the law or public health was ever really prepared to fully understand and, and evaluate and effectively judicially review um, such sweeping emergency powers that the states have um, implemented, um, literally closing down businesses, um, issuing stay-at-home stay orders um, on individuals. Um, and so the debate will go on as to whether um, these were justified infringements of civil and constitutional liberties or whether, um, you know, whether government went too far. Um, the litigation, you know, is basically, uh, and, the, and the political controversy is basically uh, extended to just about all, if not all of uh, COVID-19 um, control measures. Um, certainly there's been the claim that there was in, an unreasonable uh, interference with um, uh, commerce and property rights, which um, was not justified or ov overreaching um, for emergency health powers. Um, state legislators and governors have clashed uh, as well when the Trump administration was here, the federal and the state governments about the extent to which um, uh, emergency powers should um, be exercised and also the duration on what they were exercised. Um, and so there've been countless lawsuits around that. Um, mask mandates were similarly uh, controversial. Um, and uh, I think most litigated might be um, uh, the uh, orders of, to restrict the size of, of public gatherings. Um, Supreme Court has ruled on this several times now. Um, the first once, I think twice, um, siding with governors that wanted to restrict uh, these uh, orders um, and have them restrict, have those restrictions apply equally to um, religious uh, gatherings. Um, but two recent Supreme Court decisions with a new conservative majority have have flipped that, um, and uh, and so you know one of the big you know so this so I think that the several questions l l loom large. You know, generally, you know, how far can can a state chief executive officer go uh, operating under um, legislative emergency powers um, in controlling uh, individual behavior and corporate behavior? Um, that's the first question. The second is, you know, what's the duration? You know, how long um, can the governor uh, exercise these emergency powers? Um, and then thirdly, whether, um, how stringent the court should review them. Um, that is how, you know, should they uh, take property and, and commerce more seriously? Um, should they take individual liberty more seriously, or should they just focus on explicitly protected constitutional rights like religion or the freedom of, of assembly and petition? Um, all of these I think are at stake. None, none of them are fully decided. Uh, right now, in addition to um, lots of litigation, we also have um, uh, legislation legislators interested in reforming emergency powers, many at the state level trying to curb these emergency powers. 
um, but some um, uh, uh, who are in um, public health are looking to see about model legislation and the Uniform um, uh, uh, Commission is looking into a model emergency health powers law that that um, builds upon the um, Model Emergency Health Powers Act that I mentioned right at the beginning that I worked with the CDC on after 9-11. Um, so that's my whirlwind tour and um, over to the rest of the distinguished panel. Great, uh, Professor Hyman. Uh, so uh, following Larry when talking about public health is always a daunting prospect. Um, because you know it's what he does all the time and he's a towering figure in the field. Um, let me uh, say a couple of things. First, you know, we're just a year and a couple of months out of the first case in the United States and almost just over a year since the first stay at home orders were issued in California, subsequently replicated in many states. Uh, in terms of uh, things that have gone well uh, since then, uh, I think one important thing that's gone extraordinarily well is vaccine development, right? The estimates of the time the outbreak were, were five to 10 years away uh, and less than a year out uh, as a result of uh, both public and private uh, research and public and private funding of uh, research and development. We've got not one, not two, but three uh, vaccines, uh, one of which has some uh, pushback on, you know, and. Uh, this is truly extraordinary in the history of infectious diseases. Uh, interesting second order questions in how should we think about pricing and paying for those things, uh, particularly when there was some public funding involved uh, and significant public funding and public resources involved in what became known as Operation Warp Speed uh, during the Trump administration. I don't know what it's been renamed since then, but they scrubbed Apparently people don't like Star Trek, so they scrubbed all the references uh, to warp uh, from it. Um, but that's a truly extraordinary uh, success story that I think you know the pharmaceutical industry takes a lot of static. Um, some of it, maybe much of it deserved, uh, but they really stepped up to the plate uh, and have uh, changed the playing field in ways that uh, you know, were simply impossible to anticipate a year ago. Um, the second thing that I think uh, turned out to serve us well, uh, and I suspect I'm you know, tossing a bit of a, a grenade into the discussion, uh, is federalism. Uh, because even though uh, bugs and viruses don't respect uh, state or national borders, uh, variation in policy uh, is really the only way in which you can learn what works and what isn't, right? Models are just models. They don't actually tell you what will happen out in the real world. And so variation, uh, New York, Florida, California, uh, West Virginia, uh, in terms of uh, their you know, stay at home policies, their social distancing policies, their who gets vaccinated first and how do we vaccinate policies. All of those I think are tremendously helpful in figuring out uh, in the medium and long run, uh, what are good strategies for addressing this problem. Uh, in terms of what didn't work so well, I think, uh, you know, uh, various parts of the federal government uh, have some uh, explaining to do, to quote the old uh, Lucy episode, uh, that, you know, the CDC was created to deal with infectious diseases like this. It uh, was funded at a level that in retrospect doesn't turn out to be sufficient, uh, but maybe its focus was more sweeping than the infectious diseases and that distracted it from preparing for its core mission. Let me just read a brief paragraph uh, that sort of appeared in the news. The CDC failed to provide timely counts of infections and deaths hindered by aging technology and a fractured public health reporting system. It hesitated in absorbing the lessons of other countries, including the perils of silent carriers. It struggled to cal calibrate its own imperative to be cautious and the need to move fast as the virus ravaged the country. And your first instinct is probably to say, well, Hyman, why are you quoting yourself? It's clear that you're not keen on the CDC performance. This is the New York Times uh, uh, front page story uh, critiquing the performance of the CDC. The FDA uh, had, it, had its own issues. Uh, HHS and the Strategic National Stockpile, which had been depleted. Uh, and neither party in Congress thought it was worth spending the money 
uh, to prepare. We've historically underfunded public health at the state and local level. Uh, those are all, I think, things that didn't go nearly as well as they needed to for us to be able uh, to prevent uh, the wave of death and uh, morbidity that's the result of, as Larry said, uh, a, a once in a lifetime uh, pandemic uh, for those of us on the panel. Um, but that doesn't mean that it's the only once in a lifetime event. And you know, prepared, preparedness is gonna turn out to be something that's important uh, going forward. Uh, and I think dealing with these government failures, uh, rather than just increasing the funding, asking what went wrong and what should they be doing different uh, and what shouldn't we be funding that we were funding before is gonna be important as well. So let me stop there. Thank you, Professor Hyman. Uh, Professor Buck? Uh, okay. Uh, first of all, I wanna thank uh, Patrick, uh, his team at the Federalist Society uh, and the team at O'Neill for organizing this event and for being politically uh, ecumenical about it. Uh, we need uh, so much more conversation like this, conversation that's across our political and cultural divides, conversation that's aimed at understanding and solving problems rather than stoking angry passions. Uh, some thoughts about COVID uh, and uh, like uh, David, I will uh, defer to uh, Larry uh, uh, and his uh, towering uh, uh, standing uh, in the realm of public health. I think it should be pointed out uh, that uh, unfortunately, public health law uh, has been treated in America as a backwater. Uh, and all of a sudden here we are with the planet's number one crisis being a crisis of public health, uh, a crisis that perhaps could have been managed much better had uh, public health governance domestically and internationally uh, not been treated for so long as uh, a backwater. And Larry has been pressing hard uh, in an often uh, sometimes lonely effort uh, to get to move public health concerns up to the fore. Okay, so my quick thoughts about, my, my thoughts about COVID. There are two astonishingly different stories to tell about COVID-19 in America. Story number one is a story of a tragedy of shocking proportion. We're on track toward more death in this country if you count excess deaths as well as confirmed COVID deaths than the 675,000 that we experienced during the 1918 to 1919, really 1918 to 1920 flu pandemic. And this tragedy hasn't played out evenly across this country. During the first half of 2020 alone, before most of the dying was done, African-American life expectancy dropped by 2.7 years compared to 0 0.8 years for whites. Uh, and God knows what those numbers are going to look like once we incorporate the nightmarish surge in COVID deaths that we saw as we moved into the late fall and through the winter time of 2021. And this tragedy was avoidable. The narcissism of one man, a president who refused to meet the moment, stoked an anti-science anti madness that killed uh, hundreds of thousands. And the recent remarks of Dr. Deborah Burks and others uh, who worked uh, during the Trump uh, period uh, to try to uh, contain this virus, uh, underscore uh, the avoidability of the tragedy. But then there's story number two, and uh, David alluded to this, David Hyman. It, the story number two is a story of one of the great scientific and technical triumphs in human history. The development of vaccines in time to save the lives of millions around the world uh, if we get the vaccines out there. And it's a story of a triumph of American science. It's too early to issue definitive comparative judgments among the vaccines. This is gonna require head-to-head -head trials. Hopefully those trials will happen. But early evidence suggests that the novel American strategy of delivering messenger RNA to our cells to enable them to make viral antigen has yielded vaccines that are more effective and maybe even safer than those made via older methods, <clears throat> excuse me, 
older methods that involve delivering viral antigens directly into our bodies. And this technology could revolutionize the production of vaccines for influenza and other illnesses. It has the potential to transform the treatment of cancer as well. Uh, it's a case, just like the space program, of a, uh, of a moment of great urgency uh, leading to crash developments in science and technology that then transform other spheres in unpredictable ways. It's critical to note though, that this technology isn't in the main, the product of the pandemic. It's the product of decades of American public investment in basic science. We should draw from our vaccination accomplishment the lesson that ongoing public commitment to basic biomedical science is hugely important, even when the health benefits lie over the horizon. We also need now to act on awareness that intellectual property protection has its value and its limits. Widespread licensing of vaccine technologies to low cost manufacturers around the world is an urgent matter if we're to get most of the world vaccinated in the months ahead or even a few years ahead. And getting most of the world vaccinated is an urgent matter if we're to prevent the planet from becoming a long-term toxic stew of evolving uh, COVID variants. Uh, there's much more to be said, but uh, I'll wait till our discussion. Thank you, Professor Block. Um, Professor Westmoreland, do you want to add anything about um, the COVID discussion? I do. Um, first, I need to associate myself with the remarks. <laughs> Um, that have been previously made, uh, starting with the uh, high praise for Larry's work for years now, um, but associating myself with uh, David and Greg about some of the things that have worked well. Uh, vaccine development has been astonishing in this area. Um, and I say this as a veteran of trying to get AIDS vaccines done and still not there. Um, and we have, I also agree with David that we have done a terrible job over the years of investing in federal, state, and local public health infrastructure. Um, and I think it's a fault of politics writ large um, because we immediately go to the life threatening um, treatments, therapies, and uh, short change those things that might save us um, even uh, illness in the first place. But the thing I wanted to add was um, something that Greg alluded to, which was how disappointing I found it uh, that in the US of all places, uh, that the last administration not only disregarded science, but actively tried to subsume it to public relations and politics. Um, and for years, despite the paragraph that David read, um, CDC has been my favorite government agency, but the Trump administration almost broke it. Um, suppressing data, attempting and apparently succeeding in politically editing, editing um, reports and even what many of us regard as the sacred text of public health, the morbidity and mortality weekly report um, being edited by uh, HHS and White House staff. Um, this ends up, plus the kinds of um, activities that Greg was describing uh, by the president himself, with a whole lot uh, still to today of confused basics, um, things that should not have been confused, things that should not have been misunderstood, um, both and highly politicizing some of the most basic responses that should have been things um, that we recognized immediately as public health basics. And in turn, I agree uh, with David that this has shown us many things about federalism. But in turn, this confusion at the federal that was caused, in some cases on purpose at the federal level, has left state and local authorities um, not only flailing in some cases, but themselves public health people subject to harassment and in some cases violence, um, such that the O'Neill Institute among others has tried to provide basic uh, legal advice shouldn't say that, not legal advice, but advice about legal remedies uh, for state and local health officers to be able to protect themselves both from uh, vigilante responses and also state uh, mm -hmm. politicians who are um, politicizing the basics of public health. Um, I find that quite disappointing at the federal, state and local level um, that we were turned away, turned away 
um, from the basics of science and public health so much. I think that the new administration and the new CDC director have done much to recover um, and to repair. It's refreshing to see the amount of science-based activity and the candor about what we do and don't know. Um, but all of the, and I would note that all of this is predicated on, as David was talking about, federalism, uh, because CDC has remarkably few um, national authorities. It's dependent on cooperation between the federal government and the state uh, government for CDC activities. But not everything is, can be repaired. Um, some of the, once the, uh, what's the, what's the, once the wicked fairy has been let out of the bottle, it's hard to get him or her back into the bottle. And some of these uh, basics um, remain uh, politicized and remain uh, subjects of anger, harassment, and even in some cases, violence. Um, so I'm very pleased to associate myself with the successes that my uh, colleagues have named, but I'm also very disappointed that we all um, were led uh, to disregard science and public health um, in the most basic ways. Thanks. Oh, and Patrick, I'm sorry. I should have begun by thanking you and the Federalist Society for inviting me to be here. Thank you, Professor Westmoreland. Um, now at this time, let's uh, shift gears and talk about the uh, second topic we were going to discuss today, the current state of the healthcare system. So to start, you know, I guess, could you guys talk about like currently the system we have, what are some of the strengths of the system? What are some of the weaknesses of the system? And, you know, regarding reform, I guess we can start, is reform necessary? And if so, what policy proposals do you believe would most effectively improve our system? And are there any potential risks or downsides to um, adopting any one of these uh, proposals? We will start with uh, Professor Block. Okay. Uh, I was going to start actually with uh, uh, some thoughts about where we, uh, where, where we are politically and uh, uh, how that frames and constrains, where we are politically and legally and how that frames and constrains uh, the work uh, uh, to be done. Um, and, uh, you know, so much has been said by so many folks, including several of us uh, uh, participating on this panel, uh, including yours truly, about the extent to which our system is deeply fragmented, the extent to which it uh, fails to uh, reward uh, clinical value, uh, and the extent to which it fails to extend access uh, to both health preserving uh, and life conserving medical care uh, to uh, all Americans, irrespective of their uh, socioeconomic standing uh, and race and, and ethnicity. These are <clears throat> profound policy and moral failures that any health reform uh, that's uh, worthy uh, of our uh, respect and regard uh, needs to uh, deal with. Okay, well, let's look at some realities. First of all, the title of this event. Well, Medicare for All is in the title for this event, but Medicare for All is, is not going to happen. The politics uh, aren't there. We don't live in an alternate universe uh, in which there are 60 some Democrats in the Senate uh, and a large Democratic majority uh, in the House with the overwhelming majorities of Democrats in both houses being supporters of single payer. Uh, we live in the fragmented uh, world uh, that we, uh, uh, we, we, we live in fragmented reality. Um, even a robust public option would be a heavy lift. Given the politics, President Biden's and congressional Democrats' success at expanding subsidies for purchase of health insurance on the exchanges, and enlarging federal support for Medicaid expansion was quite an accomplishment. Another thing that's not going to happen in the imaginable future, even if Republicans take the House and Senate next year and the presidency in 2024, is repeal and replace. Uh, part of the genius of the Affordable Care Act uh, is that it's simply the most conservative means possible for pulling uh, Americans into the financial risk pool to the extent necessary to expand coverage by tens of millions of people compared to where we stood before the Affordable Care Act was passed. 
That's why every Republican replacement plan proposed during the Trump years founded, uh, all would have taken coverage away from 10 to 20 million or more people. And uh, some of you all might remember a period of time when Rep Republicans would make repeal and replace proposals and then await for a Congressional Budget Office uh, uh, assessment. Uh, and then those uh, proposals would be blown out of the water every time the CBO came back with projections uh, for up to 20 million or more uh, people losing uh, insurance. Uh, and it's simply not now politically acceptable to strip coverage from uh, that many people. Expectations of coverage are too locked in. And that means expectations of society wide spreading of the financial burden of medical care are locked in. This is a huge problem uh, for uh, conservatives, uh, many of whom in fact reject society wide spreading of medical care's financial burden, even when this rejection requires many to go without health care. This rejection is what animates, uh, I submit, the repeal and replace uh, quest. And yet American politics is no longer a safe space for Republicans to admit to either this rejection or their willingness to see tens of millions of Americans go without health insurance uh, and care. That's a, that's a bind uh, for uh, Republicans. And I would anticipate that over the uh, medium to longer term, there's going to be acknowledge, acknowledgement that uh, this expectation of coverage, like expectations for Medicare and Social Security in previous generations, uh, that these things uh, are baked in. Uh, so what's the real work that needs to be done and that can be done? Uh, well, uh, uh, I and some, but perhaps not all of us uh, in this group, uh, believe that expanding access to make it truly universal uh, is an urgent matter in order to uh, uh, finish the job that the ACA uh, started. And I would uh, single out uh, Tim Westmoreland uh, for a leadership career uh, on this front. Uh, his bio left out uh, his um, heroic work that he did uh, uh, while um, working as a staffer for Representative Henry Waxman uh, in gradually expanding uh, the Medicaid program under very difficult political conditions. Uh, and Tim also ran the Medicaid program during the period within the uh, of Clinton uh, years. Um, and so the, the expansion of access uh, is critical. Uh, but there's real work that needs to be done on the cost side, uh, particularly if we're going to not see healthcare as a suck on our, our economy uh, and not see healthcare as a suck on our ability to make investments, public investments, as well as private investments in things that are uh, much more, more, more urgent to keeping this country at the cutting edge. Uh, soaring medical costs, taking spending and value seriously Neither Democrats nor Republicans have done very well at this. And the Affordable Care Act does very little to set value-based limits on medical spending. In fact, a few of the uh, provisions within the Affordable Care Act that had the most promise for getting at medical spending uh, have been uh, eliminated by uh, Congress uh, in subsequent years. That's something we could talk about if folks want to. Um, and a huge challenge here is the interaction of human psychology, our expectation uh, that people uh, rescue others in dire need, in fact, our admiration for rescuers, uh, the interaction of this psychology of rescue, of Americans can do technology loving culture, the very thing that got us uh, uh, much of the way towards COVID vaccines also poses a threat when it comes to low value health spending and the settled expectations of healthcare industries, many large uh, players. Health insurance payment and intellectual property protections that are untethered to clinical value. Uh, uh, and uh, 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 these things uh, turbocharge uh, investment in the low marginal benefit technologies of the future, sustaining the process of rising costs. But we need to get a grip on this process. And any strategy that can be cast as rationing is going to, whether it's a strategy pursued 
by uh, the public sector, Medicare or Medicaid, or by private insurers, think about the backlash against managed care in the late 1990s. Any strategy that can be cast as rationing is a political non-starter. Nobody wants to see grandma put metaphorically uh, on an ice floe. So the strategy here, the, rather the long-term challenge here, is to nudge the trajectory of technological change in a more value-oriented, cost-conscious direction uh, without uh, uh, being perceived as engaging in uh, rationing. Uh, uh, my colleague, uh, Neil Sukatme and I have set out a, a strategy for uh, doing this and we published this in a few places and we're planning to work some more on this. Um, and so that's, that's a plug for our stuff. But um, the, I think what it, however we go about it, that is, that is the long-term strategy for to avoid really scary numbers in terms of proportion of America's uh, GDP that could go to healthcare, numbers that could rise to levels over the uh, decades of this, com of this coming century in, in excess of 40 or um, 50%. Those numbers aren't gonna happen, but it those numbers underscore the urgency of getting a grip. Okay, second, I would underscore the urgency of addressing social determinants of health. And COVID has of course put these determinants in high relief. It's of course not true that the virus doesn't discriminate. It is a voracious uh, uh, class and racial uh, discriminator. Uh, COVID practices apartheid. Uh, and uh, so hopefully if one good thing can come from this nightmare, awareness of the, so, of the conditions of life and their effect on uh, health and life expectancy uh, can lead to taking these determinants uh, much more seriously. Uh, uh, I, I'm going to stop now. There's so much more that can and uh, should be said, though. Thank you, Professor Block. Uh, Professor Westmoreland. Yes, um, I think the thing that the ACA did that was most successful um, and the thing that still needs the most work um, is on Medicaid. Um, it won't surprise you. Um, I'm a hammer. Everything looks like a nail. I'm who I am and everything looks like a Medicaid problem. Um, from the, its very beginnings, Medicaid has been an incomplete program. Um, it was, most people think of it as healthcare for the poor, but it in fact is healthcare for, has been for a long time, healthcare for just some of the poor. You have to be very poor under the terms of the state. It is a federalist program to its core. Um, you have to be very poor and um, something else very poor and pregnant, very poor and a kid, very poor and over 65, very poor and totally disabled and unable to work. But for those people who had uh, didn't fit into one of these pigeonholes, Medicaid was for decades um, a program that left you out in the cold. Zero income, zero assets, homeless on the street, and you're still not federally eligible for Medicaid. Um, and this is with the federal government matching the state expenditures at levels of 50 to 80%, depending on how low income the state is. The ACA finished that, co that coverage. Um, it included all poor people, um, regardless of what category they were in. And for, the, for that expansion, the group of people who were, didn't fit into one of the pigeonhole categories before, the federal government paid 100% of the cost for the first few years and glided down to 90% um, forever after that. But then came the NFIB Supreme Court decision. Um, NFIB, I think to everyone's surprise, um, said that the federal government could not um, require states to do this as a, con a condition of receiving the billions and billions of dollars of federal spending. Um, it's a precedent setting case. I think everyone was um, astonished by it. Um, but that left the, the point that uh, the expansion to the finishing the rest of the Medicaid coverage became a state option. Um, now, and the Fed still could, would pay the vast majority of it, but a state option to decide. Um, at this point, 39 states have elected to um, expand, um, and that is the greatest success that I was referring to. That means 12 million new beneficiaries, 12 million people who didn't have health insurance before who now do have health insurance. But the non-expansion in the remaining states is 2 million more people, um, something that we usually call the coverage gap. 
It's people who are too poor to qualify for the um, health insurance exchanges, but under the laws of the state um, are too affluent to uh, qualify uh, for uh, and also are not categorically eligible. Um, so states without the um, that haven't done the expansion, the non-expansion states, also have a disproportionate number of poor people, a disproportionate number of uninsured people. And so the state has state's citizens have the most to gain at 90% federal expense and forever. And I have to add, as Greg was leading up to, a disproportionate number of black people. Um, if you look at the map, that the Kaiser Family Foundation uh, posts regularly of who is expanded and who's not, it pretty much looks like the old Confederacy. Um, and it is disproportionately a black uh, population. And I find it hard to believe that that is unrelated to the question of what states have expanded and what states not. And so the very core of federalism and its treatment for uh, racial minorities, I think is at stake in this. Um, the early COVID legislation um, passed uh, last year added 6% to the six percentage points to the, what the federal government will pay uh, for Medicaid during the public health emergency. Um, and the, so that makes the minimum payment 56% um, federal. And then many states much higher than that. Um, Mr. Trump extended that once and um, Mr. Biden has extended it again. So it's now through the middle of next year that the states are gonna have a, a, what we call a percentage bump there. And the stimulus package that was just passed um, has added a new expansion for these non-expansion, a new incentive for these non-expansion states of 5% of the cost of their basic program um, for the next two years if they'll expand to cover the people at 90% uh, federal expense um, through, uh, during the next uh, few years. This is by anyone's estimate, a huge windfall of federal dollars uh, to the states who have chosen not to expand uh, Medicaid to their citizens up until this point. No budget officer in the country would look at these numbers and say, don't do this. Uh, there are billions of dollars lying on the table for the states to choose um, to expand the Medicaid program and to reach those disproportionately poor, disproportionately uninsured and disproportionately black people who are still in the coverage gap. But we're waiting to see. That legislation is relatively new and we're waiting to see whether the states uh, will overcome their inertia and actually expand and complete the Medicaid program. But the greatest success was what the ACA did for Medicaid and the part that still remains to be done is what needs to be fixed. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Westmoreland. Uh, Professor Hyman. Uh, so uh, I've now shamed into acknowledging uh, the wonderful contributions of the Federalist Society, shamed because my other panelists got to it first, uh, the <laughs> contributions of the Federalist Society in putting this together uh, and the O'Neill Institute for uh, generously co-sponsoring it. Um, let me uh, start more or less uh, where Greg left off, um, which is on cost. The people in the field refer to the iron triangle of health policy as involving cost, quality, and access. And uh, the two presentations you've heard so far on health reform have started with access uh, and then talked about cost. Um, I actually have the opposite approach. I always start by talking about cost. Uh, in fact, I wrote a book uh, called Overcharge, Why Americans Pay Too Much for Healthcare that my three co-panelists uh, generously blurbed uh, and said nice things about it um, and hopefully believed them. Uh, but you know, the, if you're gonna look at a success of the American healthcare system, it's its success in using every dollar of resources that anyone will put anywhere in its vicinity. Um, if we're number one at anything, it's uh, hoovering up money uh, into the healthcare system, uh, often not in ways that uh, lead to population health or even individual health. Um, but are pretty good for the people that are working in the field. Uh, and the politics, not surprisingly, follow from that. Every dollar of healthcare spending is a dollar of income uh, for someone working in the healthcare field. Uh, if we don't address the cost problem, uh, no matter what we do to expand access currently, uh, we're going to end up facing a crunch downhill, downstream on those issues. The similar to what we see in Social Security, similar to what we see in Medicare. 
Uh, every year, there are trustees reports for both of those programs that basically say, guess what? We can't afford these programs. We need to do something to uh, lower the spending trajectory, lower the level of spending, improve the value. And pretty much, you know, it's like in Washington every year, the, the rose blossoms, the, the um, tree blossoms come out and there's a trustees report uh, and then nothing much happens. The, the uh, blossoms fall off. Uh, the report gets put on the shelf. Um, that's the problem uh, with the approach that, with all due respect, both Tim and Greg are pushing towards a, us, which is broader government expansion of coverage without paying nearly as much attention to the uh, fiscal aspects of that and our, the affordability of that. And uh, I, I also don't want to ignore the social determinants of health that Greg uh, and to a lesser extent, Tim both point us towards spending on healthcare uh, doesn't do much when it's the social determinants of health that are driving the outcomes. That calls for uh, reallocating spending away uh, from the healthcare system and addressing the core drivers of those things. And that's going to be an even heavier lift than expanding access because expanding access uh, isn't as fraught with controversy as taking aggressive steps to address social determinants of health. Um, with respect to Tim's observations, let me just point out that, uh, and, and also Greg's observations about sharing uh, costs more broadly, uh, there's a long history uh, in Western philosophy of viewing people as uh, deserving of assistance and not deserving of assistance. And, uh, many of our social policies fall out of that basic divide. Uh, and the original structure of Medicare, excuse me, of Medicaid, uh, as well as ideas about who qualifies for charity care, I think track that intuition. Uh, the uh, Affordable Care Act, or PAPACA, as I like to call it, because there's really not that much in there that makes care affordable. And to the extent there was, as Greg pointed out, it got scrubbed out in the political process post-adoption. Uh, represents a rejection of that view, but we'll see how sticky it is, right? The fact that a bunch of states are turning away the money uh, that Tim has rightly pointed out is on the table for them to grab indicates that uh, it's not just politics, there's also a competing moral vision about who's deserving of assistance uh, and who's not. Uh, and that I think highlights the last point I wanna make, which is debates about health reform are not simply about narrow technical issues and not simply about budgets. They're also about normative visions and the competing normative visions is the ground on which we've been fighting about health reform uh, for the last century. So let me stop there uh, and let Larry have the last word. Well, um, all I can say is I feel the same as you guys said when you followed me. I don't know what I could say that three incredible um, experts in the field and I'm certainly not one of them. I think. Uh, the one thing I can say is that I have lived under other health systems, a lot of them, Australia, Canada, the UK. Um, I've, you know, I've studied Germany's and, uh, and some of the Scandinavian systems. And so, you know, I'm tempted to say, you know, what's good about the U.S. health system? And my, you know, my answer is just nothing. <laughs> and then I could just stop. Um, but I actually kind of agree with all of the panelists. Um, to start, you know, backward, um, you know, fr from the last to the first, you know, I like David's book a lot. <laughs> you know, I think that the, you know, the, the left side of politics really should care a lot about cost and waste and fraud and all of that that he documented extraordinarily well in his book. I'm not sure I would agree with his solutions um, to that, but the main part of his book was really, we need to find solutions to it and it's just not sustainable. And I, and I think that that's a really important message. Um, you know, for me, um, you know, the Affordable Care Act, I guess is the, the anchor and, and along with Medicaid and, and Medicare, you know, I, I don't really know what the future of the American health system will be. I do know that at the political level there, you know, 
there's really a lot of um, a lot I don't agree with, and maybe almost all I don't agree with. You know, on the political left, with the kind of um, you know the idea of um, Medicare for all. You know, the the left really doesn't understand two things. I mean, one is that um, you know you don't to get to universal coverage. Very few places in the world use a single payer system like a Medicare system. So there are a lot of ways to get to universal coverage. And I just thought that there was a, you know, on, on, on the left side of the Democrats, there was a particularly um, lacking sophistication of the kinds of ways that um, we could do that. And then, you know, on the political right, you know, the, the, the message that I, at least I get, and I'm sure I, I'm 100% sure I oversimplify, is that we just have to fix the market. And I just don't accept um, that that market forces when somebody's really, really sick and when it's so complicated um, that uh, that we can do it. I know I every day I get something in the mail from MedStar explaining the costs of what it is and I'm supposed to be a good consumer. I don't even open the envelopes, I just put them down. This is just like no point. Um, you know, and then in the middle, it's basically, you know, tinkering around the edges of M Medicaid and the ACA. And I, and I think that's where the future of America is. You know, it's going to be, you know, a, you know, constant expansion of, I hope, of Medicaid and uh, of, of um, the Affordable Care Act. Um, far from, far from a perfect way for a health system to behave, but I don't expect to be alive um, when there's any truly, you know, fundamental reform of of uh, the U.S. health system. I've just been at it too long to and and seen the, you know, the the partisan divide that it's just hard to accept. And I, I think the public is just so um, so focused on their own choice you know, choosing my doctor, choosing my healthcare provider. You could see that with COVID, you know, with gaming the system and getting the vaccines first or the monoclonal antibodies. And America is kind of a, a system that where, where relatively privileged people really try to um, make a lot of what they think of or informed choices. I'm not sure they are. Um, but I, But as far as I know, no other country that's, really serious takes choice to the extent that we do. And they focus rather on cost, you know, access quality um, kinds of issues. Okay, that's me. Thank you, Professor Gosson. Um, so with the time remaining, I think we're only gonna have uh, time for uh, one Q and A. Um, and so this question I'm looking at, this is for Professor Gosson and anyone who'd like to comment. Um, you have written about some of the legal and ethical concerns surrounding vaccine passports. Uh, can you discuss your thoughts on the pros and cons of states or private actors choosing to use these methods? Um, well, you know, it's, it's a complicated subject, but I think, you know, my biggest concern about vaccine passports um, isn't the concern that I hear all the time, which is basically an autonomy or a privacy concern. I think from the autonomy point of view, um, you know, vaccine passports don't force anybody to be vaccinated, but they say if you, you're not vaccinated, you may not be able to go into certain high-risk environments. And I think individuals do have the right to make decisions about their own health and safety. I don't think they have the right um, to expose other people to an infectious disease. I think um, uh, I wrote a JAMA piece um, with uh, uh, Glenn Cohen from Harvard very, very recently. And Glenn made the point in our article, you know, that he thinks that, that vaccine passports are actually privacy protective um, because they, they don't require any medical information other than the fact that whether you've got the, um, the credential. I, I'm mostly concerned about equity. I think it's, it's that you, you can't uh, introduce a vaccine passport system and you shouldn't in a private or a, a public uh, system uh, until everybody who wants a vaccine can get a vaccine. We're not quite there yet, but I think we will be there 
um, quite soon um, in terms of equity um, that, 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 that I do think is important. I, you know, there are, there are certain areas, you know, Zeke Emanuel just wrote in the Times and others, and I tended to agree with a lot of what he said, but not everything. Um, you know, there are certain particular areas where I think um, the duty to be vaccinated um, is, is a much higher one. Um, for example, you know, um, nursing, in nursing homes, um, uh, prison settings or other uh, uh, congregate settings, and probably also in healthcare settings where I think there's a duty to, to create a safe environment for patients. Um, you know, that's, you know, in a, in a nutshell, that's it. Broadly in favor, of what, but with some caveats. Let me let me just add. I, I agree with everything Larry said, especially the point about not deploying it until we've got uh, anybody who wants it is able to get it, um, because then you're avoiding replicating the kinds of problems we're seeing on access. Um, just two additional points. One is uh, you ought to worry about someone having monopoly uh, on what counts as a vaccine passport. Uh, if we've learned anything from social networks handling of access. Uh, choke points uh, can be beneficial, but they can also be exploited in ways that uh, should make us very uneasy, hearkening back to Larry's initial point about uh, the lockdown uh, in Wuhan uh, and the sort of heavy handed measures uh, that we saw being employed. Um, but I think the good news uh, is nobody's going to require it uh, when you want to go see the cherry blossoms. And I want to uh, thank Tim for reminding me uh, that that's what access is really all about here. So I'll stop there. A, a, br a brief thought. Uh, I would, uh, this would be a David Hyman-esque thought, perhaps. Uh, I would expect that we would see uh, the market uh, driving uh, many institutions to uh, uh, require vaccine certification. Uh, and that there really uh, might not need to be as much of a role for government as some are uh, urging. Uh, I think there are going to be a whole lot of folks who'll be a whole lot happy about getting on airliners or worse, going through TSA uh, or coming back to Georgetown Law Center next fall uh, as students or as faculty or staff uh, or you know, going into a uh, Whole Foods or a Trader Joe's. Uh, if there's confidence that everybody who goes in uh, has been vaccinated and that uh, shouldn't actually lead to these institutions uh, wanting to require uh, vaccination. Uh, uh, what's scary on this, in this realm is some uh, government officials wanting to get in the way, uh, uh, most notably perhaps the um, governor of uh, Florida. It's hard to know whether he's just trying to appealing to appeal to the Trumpist wing for the purpose of the 2024 presidential primaries, uh, or whether this is a you know a larger ideological trend. The notion of actually banning, uh, pr prohibiting private industry from uh, uh, prohibiting the private sector from uh, embracing vaccine certification requirements. I think that's. Worries him, and I dare say, uh, rather, uh, rather anti-conservative. All right, everyone. Well, with that, um, we are past the uh, two p.m. Um, end date. So, on behalf of the Georgetown Law Federalist Society, I'd like to thank each of you for um, attending today's event. Um, this was a great panel, um, and um, if if uh, no one has any other comments, uh, we will. Um, conclude for the day. Thank you, Patrick. And to the Federal Society, we appreciate you organizing it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day. Bye. Bye now.